145 launches every year with a rocket that hasn't even completed a full orbital mission successfully yet. Sounds impossible? Maybe even reckless? Maybe it's the future taking shape right before our eyes. Just a few weeks ago, SpaceX filed environmental documents for massive launch expansions in Texas. Not one, not two, but three launch pads, each designed to fire starships into orbit at a rhythm the world has never seen. But how can a company go from sporadic test flights to launching nearly every two days? What upgrades are hidden in Block 2? How critical is full reusability? Really? And what lessons, both technical and painful, does SpaceX carry from the Falcon 9 era into this bold Starship future? Let's break it down. Because behind every launch is more than just fuel and fire. It's a choreography of technology, ambition, and infrastructure built to scale not just spaceflight, but our very idea of what's possible. And it all begins with a launch pad, but not the one you think of. Pad B, what is the role of the second launch pad? Cranes move, concrete hardens under the Texas sun. At Starbase, crews are welding, assembling, and lifting massive steel segments into place. Pad B, is coming alive, right next to the existing orbital launch mount. This second pad isn't just a copy, it's a calculated evolution. While Pad A supported the early Starship tests, massive, experimental, and often explosive, Pad B is being built with a different mindset. Repeatability. First comes the reinforced flame trench, angled differently to better channel the shockwaves from 33 Raptor engines. Then the ground support systems, larger propellant tanks, faster chill-down lines, automated umbilicals designed for quick reattachment, and above all, the mount itself. Sleeker, modular, designed not just for strength, but for speed. Because if SpaceX wants to launch over 140 missions per year, each pad must handle a turnaround time of mere days. Think about that for a moment. One booster lands, teams rush in, check, reset, refuel. The next launch, already being stacked. And here's where it gets interesting. SpaceX isn't just preparing Pad B to mirror Pad A. They're distributing risk. If Pad A is down, Pad B picks up the slack. If a booster explodes, launch cadence doesn't collapse. That's not just redundancy, it's strategic resilience. Hey, quick question. Have you ever noticed how airports don't rely on a single runway? Same logic here. If Starship is to become the workhorse of interplanetary travel, it needs infrastructure that doesn't blink. Now, zoom out. Pad B isn't just a piece of concrete and steel. It's part of a larger vision, a tripad network at Starbase eventually mirrored at Cape Canaveral, and maybe even on ocean platforms. Why? Because the dream isn't to fly Starship once a month, it's to fly it like an airline. And you can't run a space airline without multiple gates. So yes, Pad B matters. Not because it's flashy, but because it's essential. Essential for faster launches, safer operations, and a future where rockets roll out like airliners on a runway. And to make that dream real, it all starts at the heart of the machine, the booster, and the radical upgrades coming in Block 2. Block 2 Booster, technological upgrades for efficiency. On November 18th, 2023, Starship's second integrated flight test ended in flames. Booster 9 lost control mid-burn, and the flight termination system was triggered. Not a success, at least not by traditional standards. But what followed was the birth of Block 2. Engineers went back to the drawing board, analyzing thousands of data points. What they found wasn't a single flaw, but a network of interdependent issues. Heat shielding that couldn't hold, 
plumbing layouts vulnerable to vibration, and an engine control algorithm not yet ready for high-speed restart under pressure. So what's changing? First, the Raptors themselves. Block 2 introduces Raptor 3, a refined engine variant with higher chamber pressure, fewer welds, and improved ignition reliability. Each upgrade pushes toward a singular goal, efficiency at scale. Launch, land, refuel, repeat. Second, the booster structure. Lighter alloys are being introduced in non-critical areas. Internal bracing has been reconfigured to better absorb acoustic loads. The result? A core stage that can endure more cycles with less wear. And third, the control systems. More redundancy in avionics. Faster software for thrust vectoring. And perhaps most intriguing, rumors of automated self-diagnosis pre-launch letting the booster check itself before it ever leaves the pad. That last one's not confirmed, but it's exactly the kind of logic that fits SpaceX's pattern. Design for autonomy, then optimize for speed. And here's the key point. Block two isn't just about flying better. It's about flying faster, more often, and cheaper. In many ways, this isn't a rocket upgrade. It's an industrial upgrade, because the difference between launching 10 times a year and launching 145 isn't just materials or engines, it's systems thinking. SpaceX is trying to build a rocket that acts like software, patchable, modular, upgradable between launches. And when you look at Block 2 through that lens, it's clear. This isn't a prototype anymore. It's a product. One designed to go from launch pad to recovery zone and back without the need for complete refurbishment. But for that loop to work, for a booster to lift off and be ready to go again, everything depends on what happens after landing. That's where the dream of a fully reusable architecture takes center stage. The role of fully reusable architecture can a rocket really behave like an airplane? That's the core question behind SpaceX's fully reusable architecture. Because launching a Starship is only half the challenge, the real innovation lies in what happens after it comes back down. Let's follow the cycle. After a booster separates and completes its burn, it performs a flip maneuver using grid fins and cold gas thrusters, then begins a controlled descent Unlike traditional rockets that crash or burn up, this one aims for a pinpoint landing on a concrete pad next to the launch tower. But landing is just the beginning. Crews swarm in. First, structural checks using non-destructive inspection, thermal cameras, LIDAR scans, vibration analysis. Next, engine SWAT protocols. Raptor engines are mounted using quick release interfaces if one underperforms, it's swapped in hours, not days. Then comes refueling. Block 2 includes redesigned propellant plumbing, built to withstand multiple chill-down cycles without stress cracks. This seemingly small feature, it's key to turning around quickly, safely. Meanwhile, the Starship upper stage follows its own re-entry profile, belly flopping through the atmosphere before flipping vertically and firing its landing burn. Its heat shield is now modular, hundreds of tiles that can be individually replaced without removing the whole layer. And underneath, SpaceX is testing thermal protection for rapid inspection, not just survival. All of these changes aim at one goal, reset, not rebuild. In traditional spaceflight, a vehicle's return is the end of the line. With Starship, it's just another checkpoint. And here's the deeper logic. If your rocket needs major overhauls between flights, you'll never scale. But if you can land it, check it, refuel it, and fly again within days, you're no longer operating a rocket. You're running a logistics system. This is why full reusability matters. It's not just about saving money, though that's huge. It's about breaking the cycle of scarcity. 
making launches as routine as cargo flights, and enabling missions that aren't once in a decade, but once a week. But for that to happen, the launch pads themselves must keep up. No matter how fast you recycle a rocket, if it's stuck waiting in line at a single launch site, the entire system bottlenecks. That's why SpaceX isn't betting on one pad or even two. They're building a network of three. And in the next section, we'll see exactly how those pads work together to unlock 145 launches per year. The three-pad network, how will 145 flights be distributed? Right now at Starbase, two orbital class launch pads are under active development. Pad A, which has already hosted multiple Starship tests, and Pad B, rapidly rising with newer, faster ground systems. But behind the dunes, in a quieter zone of the complex, groundwork has already begun for something bigger. Pad C, the third piece in SpaceX's high cadence puzzle. Together, these three pads form the backbone of an audacious plan. Launch one Starship every 2.5 days with minimal overlap, downtime, or resource conflict. Zoom out a bit further and you'll see that Boca Chica is just the beginning at Cape Canaveral in Florida. Launch Complex 39A is being modified to support Starship missions, including lunar landings under NASA's Artemis program. And let's not forget SpaceX's long-term vision. Offshore platforms like Phobos and Deimos, floating launch sites that could eventually handle missions away from population centers. Compare this to just a few years ago. In 2019, Starship was still a shiny prototype nicknamed Mark I, mostly welded by hand in open air. Now, we're talking parallel launch infrastructure with custom-built tank farms, robotic tracking systems, and turnaround logistics inspired by commercial aviation. Already, SpaceX has achieved over 300 Falcon 9 launches, 100-plus booster landings, a proven drone ship recovery model, the fastest launch cadence in history for any orbital rocket. This isn't just about rockets anymore. It's about coordination at scale, scheduling, safety protocols, launch windows, engine swaps, pad resets, all working like clockwork. And that's the real story here. The three pad network isn't a backup plan or overkill. It's a necessity. If you want to launch 145 times a year, you can't afford to wait for flame trenches to cool or hold back while one pad gets repaired. You need simultaneity. You need buffer capacity. You need a system that expects stress and is built to absorb it. And honestly, that's inspiring because underneath the towers, cranes, and stainless steel is something more human. Relentless iteration a belief that the future isn't built in one giant leap, but in dozens, even hundreds of precise, gritty, coordinated steps. So here's to the teams pouring concrete at sunrise and testing valves at midnight. You're not just building launch pads, you're building momentum. And to understand how SpaceX got here and where the lessons came from, there's no better place to look than Falcon 9. Falcon 9, lessons and challenges for Starship. Here's a stat that still blows people's minds. In 2023 alone, Falcon 9 launched 96 times, more than any other rocket family in history in a single year. A commercial rocket flying like a train schedule. It didn't start that way. Let's rewind to March 30th, 2017. Mission Stas 10, that day, SpaceX did something no one had done before. They reused a previously flown orbital class booster, B-1021, launched from LC-39A at Kennedy Space Center. It carried a 5.3-ton satellite and landed, again, on the drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You. That single flight changed everything. 
Fast forward to 2020 and we get Starlink L6. A record 60 satellites in one go, launched by booster B1049, which had already flown five times. Each mission like a small miracle. Launch, orbit, return, repeat. And who could forget B1058, the booster that launched Bob and Doug on the historic Demo-2 crewed flight in May 2020, then went on to fly 15 times total, setting new benchmarks for reusability. Even in 2024, missions like Transporter 9 stood out. Launching from Vandenberg, it deployed 113 smallsats and landed flawlessly at LZ-4 California. That same booster had already seen eight missions prior. The funny part? We stopped getting surprised. Falcon 9 went from, wow, it landed, to, of course it landed. Like it was never meant to be extraordinary. But that's exactly the lesson. SpaceX turned innovation into routine. And that routine, it's now the foundation for Starship. Yet scaling from Falcon 9 to Starship brings new challenges, bigger engines, thermal stress, orbital refueling, new materials. The roadmap is there, but the terrain is rougher. Still, the Falcon legacy shows us it's possible. One booster, dozens of flights. A system that gets better, faster, cheaper, the more you use it. And that's no longer just a dream, it's quantified reality. Over 300 launches, 90 plus landings on drone ships, more than 40 boosters reused, an average turnaround of just 21 days. Falcon 9 didn't just deliver payloads, it delivered the blueprint for Starship. And now, with everything in place, from pads to boosters, to a bold reuse vision, one question remains. What does it all mean for the future? In early 2024, the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration proposed a streamlined launch licensing process designed to support high-frequency operations like those planned for Starship. It's not just bureaucracy catching up, it's a policy shift with teeth. If approved, it would allow SpaceX to group missions under a single environmental and operational framework, cutting months of paperwork per flight. This isn't just good for SpaceX. It directly supports NASA's Artemis program, the Department of Defense's rapid launch ambitions, and the broader push for commercial orbital infrastructure. But here's the real question. Can policy keep pace with propulsion? As technology races ahead, decisions made on the ground will determine what's possible in orbit. The Starship system isn't just a rocket, it's a strategic asset with implications for science, security, and even diplomacy. And in the long run, the countries and companies that can launch often will lead. The countdown has already started.